Hello friends, my name is Jeff Hunt. I am the Vice President of Public Policy here at Colorado Christian University and I manage our think tank, the Centennial Institute. Welcome to our Distinguished Lecture Series. This is our monthly lecture series featuring the brightest minds on a variety of different issues. This evening, we are excited to welcome Republican and Democrat candidates for Colorado State Treasurer. Can we give them a round of applause? We're grateful to have them, thank you. Well, our friends at Ballotpedia have a good overview of what the state treasurer's responsibilities are, and I'm going to read them here for you so you understand a little bit more about the daily roles and responsibilities of the Colorado State Treasurer. The treasurer is the state's cash management officer and heads the Department of Treasury, which includes, which accounts for, and manages the Colorado government's money. The Treasury receives all revenues in the form of taxes, fees, and other payments, disperses money, based on warrants or checks, and manages the state's investments funds. As in many states, the Colorado State Treasurer also manages the state's unclaimed property fund. To give you a sense of the different divisions the state treasurer oversees, I'm going to list them out here for you now. The Colorado State Treasurer manages the accounting division, the investments division, the cash management division, the great Colorado payback, school board intercept program, charter sorry, excuse me, Charter School Intercept and Moral Obligation Program, the Interest-Free School Loan Program, the Senior and Veteran Property Taxes Program, and the Chaffa Loan Program, which provides loans to small businesses, farms, and ranches within Colorado. Tonight, we will hear from eight candidates. We have uh, joining us Colorado businessman Bernard Douthit right here. We have State Representative Justin Everett. <laughs> Initially, we were hoping to have Route County Treasurer Britta Horn with us, but she messaged us. She comes from the Western Slope, and she's got caught up in some of the snowstorms up there and was unable to make it. We do have State Representative Polly Lawrence. <laughs> we have State Senator Kevin Lumberg. Kevin was uh, uh, also a member of the CCU Board of Trustees at one point, so we're grateful for uh, his leadership here. We have uh, State Chief Financial Officer, Charles Scheib, right there. And Colorado businessman, Brian Watson. So today, our hope is that you can hear from uh, lots of different voices so you can be informed when it comes to making a decision on who you're going to support for Colorado State Treasurer. We will begin with a five-minute opening statement from each one of them, and we'll start with Bernard here, uh, followed by a series of questions from me, and then we'll open it up to the audience for a series of questions as well. Now, we do have a straw poll that you should have on your seat. We'll be collecting those at the end of the evening. You have until 8.20 p.m. to vote. Okay, so you can listen, make an informed decision, and then vote. We'll collect them at 8.20, and then at 8.30, we'll be announcing the results of our straw poll. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Bernard, and you have five minutes, and they'll be holding up a sign in the back. I know how you politicians can get sometimes. Um, so watch the signs, and if I have to cut you off, I will, but uh, you have five minutes for opening statements. All right, thank you, Jeff. My name is Bernard Douthit, and I am running for state treasurer. You can, my first name, Bernard, easy to remember. Last name, Douthit. Uh, one way to remember that is there's no doubt about it. Uh, you want to vote for Douthit. I am a Democrat, and I have to say that I am frustrated uh, with my party to, to a, a certain degree, and I, I almost actually registered as unaffiliated. I know that a lot of people in my family, a lot of people in this state, are frustrated with both parties, the way things have been going. Uh, and really what, what I'm running against is uh, leadership in, in many respects and a status quo that I don't think is, is sufficient, is, is really failing a lot of people in this state, in this city, and, I, and I'm really just tired of waiting, frankly, is what, is what it comes down to. That's why I, I decided to run. Uh, a lot of politicians like to start and they like to talk about their home runs. What, they, uh, you know, what they've accomplished, I'll get to that. But I think it's also important that we have leaders who, who can connect with regular, regular everyday people. I started a business seven years ago, and it's been a very successful business. It's a math tutoring business. 
but we almost were shut down by road construction that wiped out a dozen businesses in our area. And I had to skip paying myself during that time. I had to go without health insurance during that time. And I know what it's like to have to tell, well, you have to think about what you're going to say to your mom or whether or not you want to tell her that you actually have health insurance or not. It's, it's hard to do. So uh, the treasurer, treasurer does uh, some important things. It's an important job, uh, often gets overlooked. Uh, it is a $7 billion portfolio the treasurer manages. Uh, the treasurer also sits on more than eight different boards, including the board of PARA, the State Employee Retirement System. And lastly, the treasurer is really, uh, I think, most significant in that the treasurer is the guardian of our money and our financial well-being. And we are at a time right now when, our, when there have been articles written about our state's bond being downgraded because of the shape that PARA is in, because of the status quo, because we, we've gotten to a spot with schools crumbling, with roads crumbling, where things are really not, uh, not in very good shape. So uh, I believe I am the most experienced, the most qualified, and the most independent of any candidate running. Uh, in terms of experience, I started out my career as an economist. I have worked as a senior financial executive in a large software company. I've actually trained bankers at the Federal Reserve. And for the last seven years, I have run my own business that I started with my own money. Qualifications, I have an undergraduate education in economics. I have a graduate degree in management and finance. And I think a treasurer should frankly have a degree in finance and understand accounting and economics. This is a $7 billion portfolio. And lastly, independence, which, which I hear a lot of people, uh, at least what I hear is people, they don't want to participate because they don't believe the political process is is for real. They think it's rigged. And they see so many politicians being being bought and so much money. And frankly, there's a lot of money in going into our state legislature by special interests like ConocoPhillips or Wells Fargo or you I mean you name it or hospital PACs. Uh, I don't I don't like it. I'm not taking corporate money. And because I'm not taking corporate money and special interest money, I, I'm not going to be swayed or influenced by those interests. As treasurer I want to do four things. First uh, the state has uh, a good share of its money with Wells Fargo and J.P. Morgan. I want to see us move our money out of those banks. We should not have our money in a bank that has been sanctioned by the Federal Reserve. And nobody that I know of spoke up about the fact that Wells Fargo has behaved very b badly. They've, they've defrauded consumers. California went ahead and suspended them from issuing debt. But the status quo we seem to have in Colorado is just to let it go and let it pass. A bank that is that is defrauding consumers. Secondly, I want to find a long-term fix for para. My mom is in para. I've got two other family members in para. But again, it's another issue where it was fully funded 17 years ago. It was in decent shape. And now it's $32 billion in the hole. It's not a good trajectory. I believe we, again, we need a finance and economics uh, person, a, a treasurer with that kind of background on the board to turn it around. I think we actually need to restructure the board. Uh, and Republicans have introduced a bill to do that, and I support it. Uh, thirdly, I want to see Colorado introduce a public bank. If you're not familiar with a public bank, uh, North Dakota has had one for 95 years. Uh, Michigan, just two weeks ago, their, their state legislature passed uh, a, a bill to start a public bank. And New Jersey, uh, Phil Murphy, who just got elected governor in New Jersey, just uh, started one in uh, New Jersey, though he's going to. He just got elected governor. By my estimates, it would bring $200 million to the state treasury. It would be something that would take some doing. Uh, if, you, if you have a chance, like Google Bank of North Dakota. It's very interesting, something I didn't know about uh, five months ago, I just learned about. Um, again, my name is Bernard Douthit. You can call me Bernie. Uh, my, my little sister, Claire, she used to call me uh, Bernard the Nerd, even though I was way cooler than she was. Uh, and you can find more information about me at BernieForTreasurer.com. Thank you. Before, before we begin with uh, Representative Everett, I do want to just thank, we have two Democrats that are up here, and uh, generally Colorado Christian University is known as a conservative school, and we always invite Democrats to come and participate with us, and I am just so very grateful that you came here and are speaking and addressing our students and the public. That means a lot to us, and I hope more Democrats will come and be a part of these events as well. So thank you, Bernard, for doing that. All right, Representative Everett. 
So, uh, Jeff, if I can't see because I'm not wearing my glasses, the timekeeper, can I ignore her? Is that kind of what I can do? Okay, good. Because uh, you never give a politician a microphone, definitely not for five minutes. Hi, I'm State Representative Justin Everett. I'd be honored to be your next state treasurer. You know, I'm glad to hear that, and first of all, thanks for coming, but I'm also glad to hear that you read off almost everything the state treasurer does because during all my speeches, and we've made a few over 48, 49 counties and 50,000 miles in the car, but the state treasurer basically does three things, the three most important things. Oversees the uncle property office which is a little bit of a mess and that's because of our public employee system that we need to deal with number two manages north of six billion dollars in cash funds and then also the big enchilada is serves on the board for the public employer retirement association PIRA which could be up to 83 billion B as in boy underfunded so really this is a finance position especially when it comes to PIRA you need somebody that actually does have a finance background to handle these issues so I have an MBA in finance. I used to do investment management and cash management for small businesses in my private life. And if we don't have someone that understands these issues and can go toe to toe with the PIRA board that has been pretty, let's say, not transparent about what they've been doing, you know, we're gonna be in trouble. And let, let's put that in perspective. If PIRA is 83 billion underfunded, who here knows what the state budget is? Okay, we have a couple of people. It's about $30 billion, so it's nearly three times the entire state budget. So this is a huge, important problem. So dealing with PARA, I actually have a bill up in committee on Wednesday dealing with the PARA board to make it more balanced. Because right now, it's been mostly PARA members that are either currently getting benefits or get future benefits. It's basically been the fox watching the hen house. So my bill actually balances that out, keeping the state treasurer on the board, but also real professional people that understand what we need to do to fix it, whether it's tax implications, how we're going to invest, to make sure that we preserve PARA, if at all possible. But the problem is, is that we don't know how deep and how wide PARA is, because they have not been that transparent um, you know, in years. And in fact, to put this in perspective for you, last year I ran a bill on PIRA to basically let us see the books to oversimplify that. So I'm pretty conservative. I've run bills on guns and life, and normally in those controversial issues, we'll get you know 20 to 25 people out there to testify against it and scream in my face. And those are really controversial issues that bring people out. I had 45 people show up to testify against my transparency bill for PIRA, just so we can see the books. So obviously when there's smoke, there's fire, it's a major problem. But we also need somebody that isn't just qualified, but actually you can trust with your money. I have the most conservative voting record in arguably the history of the Colorado legislature. When it comes to watching your taxpayer dollars and watching over the state's money, I have that proven record over the last six years, consistently finishing number one in rankings like Colorado United Taxpayers and Principles of Liberty. And we need a true conservative that understands finance and actually is conservative that you can trust with your money. But let's talk about, since we're at CCU, where those values come from. So I'm a Christian, and my faith is, is hugely strong with me. So when I look at the Constitution, I look at these rights that are granted to us by God. And when you put God first, you realize that everything else comes easy. I make a lot of tough votes, and I vote no quite a bit, and people sort of frown upon that. But really, I don't feel uncomfortable doing that because I have my faith in God. I know our rights come from the Constitution. I follow the Constitution because it makes it easy because of my faith. And I think that's hugely important that you know the moral character of the people up here before you vote for them. So if you're looking for someone who's conservative, that's actually qualified for the job, and also can win because I actually won in a competitive House seat in the state legislature, I need your vote, not only today on the straw poll, but I need your vote, support, and treasure, ironically running for state treasurer, uh, in this upcoming election. State Representative Justin Everett, thank you and God bless. All right, Representative Lawrence. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Good evening, I'm Polly Lawrence and I am also running to be your next Colorado State Treasurer. Um, and I just, I see a lot of folks in here. There are some folks that I do know and a lot that I don't. So let me just give you a little bit of background on myself. Um, I ha am a, an owner of a local construction company that's been in business since 1924. Um, I actually married into the business when I married my husband, who's sitting in the back row. Um, and when I married into the business, I didn't go into the office uh, where he was working at the time. I actually went into the field and I was a flagger 
to start my career in the construction industry. I was that girl standing on the side of the road with a stop sign. Um, and once I proved myself as a flagger, I did eventually move into the office where I learned the estimating contract management and managed some construction projects for the company. But I also learned the banking, bonding, finance, and handled some of the union negotiations for our company. Until last year, we were a union contractor with three different unions for our employees. But we worked with our employees and put together a package that was better than the unions could offer, and our employees voted to stay with us and leave the unions. That's the kind of battle that I've taken on in the business world. So I've learned to sign the fender I've signed the front of a paycheck and managed anywhere from 150 to 350 employees. So managing a large staff is not anything that's new to me. But going into the treasurer's office with that kind of experience, three things that I plan to focus on as your next state treasurer are ending the year-end spend, reforming para, and locking the revolving door. Ending the year-end spend deals with every department they seem to go out of their way in that last four to six weeks of the budget cycle where they feel this need to spend every penny that they've been given for that budget year. I think if we went to a true zero-based budgeting process and a multi-year budget cycle where they would have to plan their expenditures for a longer period of time, we'd have a better sense of what our budget is and find some savings instead of them going out of their way to spend all of your money in those last four to six weeks. Reforming para, I think that's going to be a consistent trend that you're going to hear from most of the candidates. And our current treasurer, Walker Stapleton, has done a great job of shining the light on what's wrong with para. By their estimates, they have a $32 billion unfunded liability. By others, it's 50 and it might be even higher than that. So we have a serious problem. And the fact that in their last actuarial review, they finally realized that people are living longer and that's a problem with their formula. Apparently, they're the only ones who didn't know that. <laughs> um, so there are going to have to be some changes. We need to make sure that the promises made to retirees and near retirees are kept. But for those folks who aren't vested in the system or just coming in, it's going to have to look dramatically different. We're going to have to raise the retirement age. We're going to have to flatten out that benefit package. And we're going to have to make sure that the system is sustainable going forward. And finally, locking the revolving door. We've seen too often where state employees ostensibly working on behalf of the state with a company or negotiating a contract. Once that contract is signed, they leave the state, go to that company, and oversee the work they just negotiated. They're basically negotiating their next job with your dollars. And that has to stop going forward. Those are three things that I plan to focus on as your next state treasurer. My name is Polly Lawrence. My website is polly2018.com, and I look forward to the questions. Thank you. Senator Lumberg. Thank you, Jeff. I appreciate the opportunity that uh, you afford all of us here. Um, let me start with this. I'll give you my name. It's kevinlundberg.com. <laughs> now, I add that because I encourage you to go to my website and check out. Uh, I'm, I've been given uh, five minutes to present myself, which is much more generous than we've seen in any other forum we've been in. <laughs> but it's just a fraction of who I am. And I encourage you to check out the websites for everyone or, or whatever uh, form of information they have for them because this is an important area that we need to focus in on. Oftentimes, the, you know, the lower ticket statewide uh, offices are kind of glossed over. We want to know who's running for governor, which is vitally important, and put the right person in place. But every statewide elected official, I believe, has a significant responsibility to, number one, do their job, but number two, provide that leadership that is so important for the state of Colorado. Now, a little bit about myself. I'm a third generation Coloradoan. Um, grew up in the state, uh, was a small, am a small businessman. Uh, been that way all of my life, uh, all of my adult life. And, and that started pretty young, too, frankly. But um, I also am a, 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 a husband, a dad, 
and uh, a few months ago, a grandfather. <laughs> and that's important to me because that's really why I serve in office. It's because of the people that I am responsible for. And I believe that as the state treasurer for Colorado, it's not just how you run the office, and I'll get to that for a minute. But the more important issue, in my mind, is to represent all the people in all that we do. When I write a letter, I usually sign it for life and for liberty, because those are important principles of good government. And I believe every elected official needs to keep their eye on that um, value that we are not here to run your life. We are here to do the necessary business of government. And most importantly, you go back to the Declaration of Independence. It says that governments are established among men to secure our God-given rights. That's what every office is all about. Now, when it comes to the treasurer, I often hold up my wallet and say, I'm here to protect your wallet. And what does that mean? That means ensuring the financial integrity for the state of Colorado. That is such an, an important component to running a good government, is making sure that everything is in order. And if you look around the country, sometimes that isn't always the case. Indeed, here in Colorado, we've got a few glaring examples of where it's gone wrong. Uh, for the most part, though, I think uh, we balance our budget and uh, we pay our bills. Um, but there are areas that need to be corrected. Now, why am I the guy who could fulfill this job? Well, I've been in the legislature for, uh, well, this is my 16th year. Currently, I'm the, the chairman of the Senate Appropriations Committee, and I serve on the Joint Budget Committee, and I've served on most of the other committees through the years. But I've learned about all of the various mechanisms within state government. And so when I lift up the hood to look under you know, and see what all the p various parts are for the state of Colorado. I understand that not just from the perspective of, of the, the, uh, the, the facts and the figures the, of the numbers, but I understand what it means when I look at the uh, responsibilities the treasurer has for school districts. I know about those districts across the state and, and how that interfaces with the School Finance Act. I understand that when we talk about PARA, that that is um, something that, that uh, about 100,000 Coloradoans depend upon today, about a half million Coloradoans have some relationship with, and every Coloradoan has a responsibility to make sure it continues. Those are important values and principles that I want to bring to the state treasurer's office and provide that leadership to be that watchman on the wall to do what is necessary to ensure that this office really does serve we the people for life and for liberty. Thank you very much. Don't forget my name, KevinLundberg.com. Charles, it's all yours. Thank you. Let's see if this works. Can you hear me? Yep. I'm Charles Quinshib, and um, I'm uh, running for state treasurer, and uh, like, uh, and, and I'm representing the Democratic Party. But uh, a little bit about me: I am not a career politician. I have, uh, oh, I guess, I ran for office the last time when I was 18, and that was a while back. <laughs> um, but I'm a businessman who just happens to have been serving the last 11 years as the CFO handling the state's finances in the treasurer's office. So I feel that uh, this uh, is a unique qualification that uh, uh, makes me suited for the treasurer's position. Uh, as far as uh, my 30 years that I spent in the private sector, I've been in everything from banking to affordable housing. I have fostered numerous entrepreneurial ventures, and I've also consulted with Fortune 500 companies. Uh, as a successful businessman, I have uh, started companies, I have made payrolls, and I've created jobs and opportunities. And uh, I believe that this experience will be very meaningful 
ahead. And uh, that's, you know, just who, as a taxpayer out there, which y'all all are, who would you rather have, you know, managing, as everybody's acknowledged, your multi-billion dollar portfolio and, and budget? You, would you like somebody who has never done such? Or do you want somebody that's been doing it every day for over a decade? And I think it's, it, the, the answer's clear. And, uh, you know, I hope that uh, you'll consider that when you make your choice. I, I look back, I was uh, in 2007, something more important than just the amount of time as CFO. 2007, I was hired by Kerry Kennedy to serve as CFO in a time of economic turmoil. And I've been doing such for the last 11 years. And that's important too, because the last seven years have been under Walter Stapleton. And I've served, I, I, I think, in acknowledging that why are Democrats here at CCU? Well, if you pay attention to the responsibility of the treasurer, the treasurer is there to be fiscally conservative. And I can truly say that in the 11 years I've been in the office, we haven't changed of what, at all the way that uh, we manage your portfolio. It's your hard-earned tax dollars, and it's very important. And uh, one of the most important things about that is that the better that we manage your money, the more services that you will receive or the less taxes that you pay. So it's very important, but we do adhere to uh, the three main objectives of keeping it safe first, having it liquid, and then yield. So we're very conservative in the investments. You can check the website. Every single investment that we have is out there. We have quarterly reports listed out there. And, you know, you, you, you know it's one of the things that we did when, we, when I started was make sure that we had all that transparency out there because that was a question in the past. You can check the investment policy of a very, uh, very conservative investment policy. And, uh, you know, going forward, I hope that uh, you'll consider my experience and my background. I think everybody so far that has spoken said experience is important in this job, and I believe that it is. I think that it needs to be more than a politician. It needs to be someone that has the financial background, which all the candidates here seem to be uh, quite suited. I think uh, the one big difference to remember is that, you know, I've been right there managing the day-to-day -day activities in the treasurer's office. So I'm Charles Quinn Scheib, and uh, real easy, if you want to check my website out, it's quinntowin.com. Right. And Thank it's one in on Quinn. Thank you for <laughs> Thank having you, me. Thank you, Charles. All right. Brian Watson. Well, there's one benefit to being the guy down here at the end. I can actually stand. So I hope you're okay with that. I want to acknowledge Jeff Hunt and his team for putting this together. And I want to acknowledge all of you. You could be somewhere else tonight. Instead, you're sitting in that seat, uh, getting informed and being part of the political process. So let's give you all a round of applause. So uh, my name is Brian Watson, and for those that don't know me, uh, I've been involved with CCU and the Centennial Institute for a while. Uh, in fact, uh, any of you know Professor McTavish at all? Mm -hmm. He has me come out uh, each year and speak to his class about entrepreneurship and to encourage uh, a lot of the students here. As I said, I've also been involved as a supporter not only with the Centennial Institute, but the Western Conservative Summit. And I love what you all do out here. It's a good work, and I'm very, very grateful. So for those that don't know me, uh, I grew up on the western slope of Colorado, little town of Olathe. Anyone know where Olathe is? Anybody ever driven through Olathe? If you blinked, you saw Olathe, and that was kind of the end of it. But I was over there this weekend with my mother and uh, uh, sister. And, you know, growing up on the western slope taught me a lot of great values. And I'm the only candidate here that can say that not only did I grow up on the Western Slope with those values, but I've also come over here to the Front Range, been educated, and have grown companies here. You know, my family taught me about blessings and hard work in that order, and I never take those for granted. They also taught me about dining room table economics. Sometimes when we talk about big numbers and state government, people kind of get lost and lose track. What's another 10 million there or another billion over there? But you know what? It's a lot of money. And we need to make sure that the state remembers that it's the people's money. 
It's not the state's money at the end of the day. So anyway, I grew up over there. I went to school up in Boulder and got a degree in real estate. And I started my company called North Star Commercial Partners 18 years ago. And I started above Ted's Montana Grill uh, down on Larimer Square. And since then, we've been blessed and fortunate in building it into a company where we get to employ about 60 people. And now we own assets in 16 states throughout America. Why do I tell you that? Well, my first job at CU, I didn't come from a family of money. I remember about blessings and hard work. My first job at CU was shoveling horse stalls. I had to put myself through college. And I was very, very grateful that I had that experience. And now we own a portfolio that's worth about a billion dollars or so, approaching about a billion dollars around the country. And we own assets in 16 states. Our specialty is to go in and buy vacant buildings. See, I missed that class at CU that told me to get an income stream in place. I want to invite vacant buildings. But we do it for a social impact. We want to create jobs and opportunity and empower Americans. And so we do that all around the country. We also go into inner cities and we buy vacant buildings for charter schools. To me, education is one of our civil rights issues of our day that we have to get right in America. And so I've been married for a little over 20 years, have three kids. Uh, one lives in Nashville, uh, a couple kids that go to Valor. We were one of the uh, founding families of Valor to get started. My daughter was the first graduating class. And so why am I running for state treasurer? Well, this stuff matters. It affects all of us at the end of the day. I'm the only candidate who's made a pledge not to take a salary from state government when elected. The reason is, I want to do my part to try to save each of you as much money as I possibly can and to reduce the cost of government. I also believe that my experience and investment expertise, and not only being an entrepreneur, but hiring people and building a company over 18 years, can add a lot of value to the state treasurer's office. You know, we hear things about para and 32 billion here. Well, you know what? Right now, the economy is extremely frothy in certain areas, places like New York and San Francisco. And if you're sitting across the table from that three-piece suit and you have no financial understanding or acumen, you can get this state in a whole lot of trouble. And that $32 billion unfunded liability with para could turn to 40 billion, 50 billion. What I'm really good at is every single day looking for great investment opportunities. I'm also the only candidate who's been in a fiduciary responsibility by having investors invest in each one of my deals and buying those real estate deals around the country. I would be truly honored to serve you. I don't want to be a politician. See, politicians care about their own skin and the next election. I want to be a statesman who's willing to make the tough decisions to try to move our state forward on a different level. Thank you so much. Ryan, go ahead and stay standing if you want. I'm going to ask the first question to you, and we'll work our way back this way. All right, first question. Has Walker Stapleton done a good job as a state treasurer? If so, what did he do right? If not, what needs to change? Yeah, I think Walker Stapleton has done a good job. Uh, I think two of the main things that he's done, I love the you know, great Colorado give back program with unclaimed property. Uh, those assets are the people's. They're not the state's, and return it to them. Uh, the other thing that I think he's done a good job is he's fought the fight. By the way, I feel like a singer here with this whole thing. Um, <laughs> and I forgot to mention you have one minute to answer. Okay, Everyone quickly. has one the minute The other thing he's answer. done a really good job on is with regards to bringing light into para and trying to fight the good fight uh, to have para be more accountable and share their information. Right. That was a little quicker than one minute. Yeah. Well, I didn't know. I felt like I, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I want to be quick. Now, Charles, I think the state treasurer is your boss, right? Yes. So has the state treasurer done a good job? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> that was easy. Uh, what are you going to keep going that, that he's done a good job doing, or what needs to change? Well, I mean, you know, clearly we need to come up with a solution for para. That's imperative. Uh, in the 11 years I've uh, worked in the office, I've developed a, a, a rapport in, with the rating agencies, but uh, it's very important because we've got put on negative outlook by S&P, and we've got to come up with a solution, and we've got to come up with a solution. Hopefully this session, I'm not avoiding, you know, because I wouldn't be in office yet, but, uh, you know, we definitely need to, to cure para. Right. I mean, otherwise we might be schools, infrastructure, everything may be in jeopardy. Right. Senator Lumberg. 
That's a great question, Jeff, uh, which uh, puts everybody on, on, uh, on edge, too. <laughs> but uh, uh, I would say as, as far as uh, the, the highest marks I would give to uh, Treasurer Stapleton is that he has been uh, that watchman on the wall when it comes to para. I know the first year that he was elected, he, that boy, he went on the warpath and said, we've got a problem, we've got to fix that. Now, he wasn't the first treasurer who really, I heard that from, it was Mark Hillman when he served in that position uh, briefly, um, same message, and out of that did come some, uh, some changes back in 2010. We did do some modifications to para, but, but let me develop that just slightly, and that is it's, it's not the treasurer's ability to actually fix para, it's the, the General Assembly's responsibility to set the policies in place, and then the para board, he's one of 15 voting members, so he can be there on the front row, and he's done a good job there. Uh, and if I had more than a minute, I'd talk to you about the unclaimed property tax and how we need to cure a little, some problems there. Thank you. Right. <laughs> a teaser there. So. Representative Lawrence. Thank you, Jeff. Um, well, I'm going to echo the fact that Walker has done a great job shining a light on para. But I think one of the other things that he's done, which is really beneficial for the state, is he looked at all the different departments that had bonding capability. And when they were issuing those bonds, they weren't always following um, federal guidelines on reporting and managing uh, the system. And he brought all of that in-house. So that's now under the treasurer's office to make sure that every department that has bonding authority in state government uh, is now meeting the requirements of federal regulations. I think that's a huge uh, impact that Walker's had on the treasurer's office. Yeah, I, I think uh, Walker Stapleton's done a great job. And, and first and foremost, because he's been bold. Normally when you run for state treasurer, you're gonna be the state treasurer, you're looking for higher office. So you sort of take a mulligan on taking a bold position. I mean, I can go anywhere in the state of Colorado in 50,000 miles, I can say, Pira, and the whole crowd will know what I'm talking about without having to explain it, because Walker's done a great job. And if you really look at solving the problems for Pira, because Walker's educated everybody in solving the problems, is that it's gonna be a lot of heavy lifting and a lot of hurt. So you need someone who's bold in the state treasurer's office because it may just be a one-term oppor uh, opportunity. And if it's only gonna be a one-term opportunity, you need the person in there that actually has done the heavy lifting, made the tough decisions, I'm the only one in the race that's done that. Well, I have to disagree with folks up here. I think that, first of all, we earn 1.1% on our money in the Treasury of Virginia. I did a little bit of checking. Virginia earns 1.5. Wyoming earns 1.9. Every half a percent is another $30 million. The other with the issue with para, in studying this and really looking at this from a, from a distance, why do we have this deficit? Why do we have this problem? We do because we are underpaying teachers. We're underpaying teachers on the order of $11,000 a year, about 20% under what Wyoming, Wyoming, we can keep up with Wyoming, I hope. We underpay teachers $11,000. And what we've been doing is promising them these, these benefits and not giving them raises. And I think Walker Stapleton could have been more imaginative or more, I guess, more constructive in working, working with the legislature and finding a, finding a way to, to, do, to fix that. Great. All right, we're gonna talk a little bit more about para, and I'm gonna start with you, Bernard. Um, according to a Denver Post review of thousands of pages of financial reports, and let's lay the groundwork here. Para is the Public Employees Retirement Association, okay? So this provides um, retirement benefits for a number of public employees, um, and, it's, and it's, it has a giant liability, and we're gonna get into this in a second. But they've been reviewing Thousands of pages, the Denver Post has been reviewing thousands of pages of financial reports, hours of public meeting recordings found that state lawmakers and the petition board alike ignored numerous red flags about the landmark pension reform that was passed in 2010. So Senator Lumberg, you kind of mentioned that, that there was a reform effort in 2010. But um, there was a lot of uh, concern about that reform effort. Opting time and time again, for public expediency at the expense of the Public Employees Retirement Association's long-term financial health. Now, PARA is barreling, this is the words of the Denver Post, towards its second watershed moment in a decade. PARA has only 58.1% of the money it owes in future retirement checks. Its funding gap has ballooned to $32.2 billion by one accounting measure, $50.8 billion by another, one in 10 Coloradans is going to be is a member of PARA and will be affected by what you all decide to do with regards to PARA. 
The state treasurer has a seat on the board of Para. What are your ideas for solving this problem? And I'll give two minutes for this answer. So do you want to start, Bernard? So first of all, first of all, one of the things that I did in looking at, at pension programs, there are, there are states around the country uh, that, that are almost fully funded, that are actually in pretty good shape. Uh, and those states are, are uh, it's a heterogeneous mix. It's like Oregon, Tennessee, New York, Wisconsin. What those states do, and this is kind of goes to Justin's bill, is those states have boards that have a minority, not a majority, but a minority of plan members on the board. They also have, uh, on average, a, a lot more finance and ex economics expertise. As a Democrat, this is one thing that I, that I, I think has been status quo. D the Democrats haven't stood up and said that this board isn't, hey, they aren't doing such a great job. They need to be, we need more finance and economics expertise on this board, first of all. Um, the, the other thing, again, that I would get back to is that we have been, we have not been giving teachers raises and instead we keep giving them, promising them benefits. And we've got to live up to this promise. Um, and then the, the last thing I'd say that's near and dear to my heart, I, I uh, volunteered, you'd find it out for Colorado Care. I think we need to, healthcare costs have been eating away at the state government, eating away at, at personal pocketbooks, eating away, it's just, it's been, it's this wrecking ball. And I think we've got to deal with that as well. And if we, if we deal with that, restructure the board, we'll, we'll be in much better shape. Thanks. Right. Representative Everett. And thank you, Jeff. So a, a couple issues. I mean, first and foremost, when we look at solutions, we have to have transparency. I mean, you heard what Jeff just said. They had to look through thousands and thousands of pages of documents to get to the bottom of what they think is the problem. So one of the bills that I am running again this year that we had 45 people show up to testify against last year is really open up the books, allow the people on the board to actually see the books. I think that's step one is transparency so we can see how deep and how wide it is. Number two is reforming the board. You cannot have the fox watching the hen house. In fact, I remember back in 2001, after we'll just call it the internet bubble burst, where people were sounding alarms on Pira. So we're looking at compounding what's happened and not solving the problem back then to where we may actually, and I may be the only person that will say this, and it might get me in trouble, especially if you're expecting Pira, to where we're so far in trouble potentially to where we may have to cut benefits that may just be more than a COLA freeze, a cost of living freeze for current retirees. And that's unfortunate, but that's the political reality and the reality that we have, because we want that check to show up or that direct deposit to show up in your mailbox or in your account. So I think it's hugely important. But we have to see what the actual numbers are before we propose solutions. And you'll hear just what, what, what we've all been able to glean from what other pension systems have done, like sort of spreading it across instead of your best three years where you're <coughs> going to take all of your years of service under PIRA, things like that sort of lower the base and adjust the actuary tables to see what the payouts are because most people are under the defined benefit plan. So first and foremost, transparency. Second, we need to change the board. Third, then we can work on the solutions. Great. Representative Lawrence. Thank you, Jeff. Um, I, this is a big to topic of conversation and has been for quite a while. Um, our former executive director of PIRA who um, unfortunately passed away suddenly this year when he would come in to talk to us about what was going on with para as I said I have worked with union pensions for 30 years they made the same promises that para is making to their retirees so I kept asking him you're promising 8% where are you getting that year over year how many of you out there get 8% year over year on your investments ooh that's awesome talk to you later <laughs> Yeah, well, <laughs> I want to know who your investment advisor is. Um, for the most part, that's, that's an unrealistic number, and it should have been lowered quite a while ago. Uh, but there are some things that need to be done. But first and foremost, for those retirees who are retired in the system and near retirement, they have PARA. They do not have Social Security. This is the promise that the state made to them, and we need to make sure that that promise is kept. But again, for folks who are not vested, meaning they haven't worked in the system for at least five years, it's going to look very, very different. The retirement age has to increase. You can't mathematically collect retirement for a longer period of time than you worked in the system. And that benefit package that right now is based on your top three years, that has to go out to at least your top 10 years and maybe your entire career to make it realistic. Uh, there's a lot of different things that can change in that. 
But if the state is gonna continue to promise a retirement system, we need to make the changes to make sure that promise can be kept going forward. Great, thank you. Senator Lumberg. Thank you, Jeff. Um, boy, so many things come through my mind on, on this particular issue. It is in, uh, a big job for the treasurer to keep an eye on this, and being a board member, you know, he's got a front row seat on this. But let me reiterate what I'd said earlier, and that is that it's up to the state legislature to set the policies at the right level. So I believe the treasurer needs to work with the legislature to find these solutions, and you're hearing the solutions. It amounts to um, some, some uh, uh, as some people call it, haircuts in a lot of places. Um, I was talking with a friend of mine who's a, the chairman of the pension committee for the Texas House, who actually tackled this for a couple of, of pensions in Dallas and uh, Houston last year. He said some total, they were about $60 billion underfunded. And he said, we got it done. It was the toughest thing I ever did in the legislature, and there were only a few death threats, but we got it done. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's, it's a tough job. It's going to take leadership that insists on getting the job done. And it's not unique to Colorado. I was on the phone with uh, Jonathan Williams. He's the uh, chief economist for the American Legislative Exchange Council just this afternoon discussing this very point of, of how do we fix para. He wanted to know how we were doing in Colorado. And I told him, well, I think we're headed the right way. I'm not sure we're going to get there this year. And I know that the state treasurer, whoever they are, is going to have a big job ahead of them still. Um, and again, you're going to hear all of, all of the solutions here because it's, in a sense, it's simple math, but in another sense, it's really a political question. Who can exert the leadership necessary to actually get us across the finish line? Great. Thank you. Charles? Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think obviously the first thing that we need to do is uh, balance the board and, and get uh, a, a, a better mix so that you know so we can work on solutions because yes while it's the legislature's responsibility we need a board that's going to respond to the changes that are necessary and in thinking about that and we go back and look at 2010 and what went wrong there because there's a disagreement whether they didn't do the right thing or did well the main problem in 2010 is that one it, you know, they said, here's what we need. Okay, we'll phase it in. And then there was no mechanism to adjust on an annual basis. So here we are, 2018, in more serious trouble than we were in 2010. So I think definitely whatever solution comes up has to be something that can be ongoing. It has to be so that this is what we need today. And there's no phase in. I mean, if you need that today, that's what needs to be today. And, and that's why I, th I think one of the words that they used was it needs to be shared responsibility. You know, it, rather than everybody pointing their fingers at, well, it's their fault, their fault, their fault. I mean, we all have to come up with a solution. It doesn't really matter whose fault it is. Thank you. Great. Mr. Watson. Well, first of all, I would say that uh, this is not a partisan issue. It shouldn't be a partisan issue. This is a people issue. My sister's a school teacher up in Erie, and she's working hard every single day, and she's depending on this. And it's not only 600,000 people that are affected by this, it's a whole lot more. You see, each one of these people who are getting this retirement are living in small towns and communities all throughout our state. And they're spending money at the grocery store, at the movie theater, and it has a ripple effect. So it's not just these 600,000, it's an entire state. I recently was with Americans for Prosperity, and the estimate is throughout our country that these different uh, retirement programs are unfunded between one to six trillion dollars, with a T. Yes, we're at 32 billion, but this is a problem around our country. And I really believe Colorado can be the solution for it. I think it starts with positive leadership. Yes, the treasurer is one person on this board and one voice. But everything I've been doing throughout my career is about building bridges and tearing down barriers among people. The people on the other side of that table on that board, they have kids. They know someone who's depending on this retirement. First and foremost, build a relationship with them. Listen to their ideas and figure out how collectively we can get the ball across the finish line. Secondarily, I would say it's about transparency and education. Sadly, most of the people on the para board are not financial experts. 
These are not the people that you would go and trust your personal retirement with. They're well-intended people, but they're not necessarily financial experts. And so I think having somebody on that board that can help to educate them and explain that process. Personally for me, I don't do investments without a double-digit return. Now granted, that's not for the state of Colorado. First and foremost, you need to be a good steward and be conservative with the people's funds. But at the same time, the third point would be asset allocation. I think it's unacceptable that you're looking for a 1% return. We should look at the entire portfolio and say, okay, this small piece of the portfolio could get a reasonable and conservative double-digit return, but the most of it has to be conservative. Thank you. Great. Thanks. All right. At this point, we're going to turn it open to the crowd. Um, you're welcome to ask a question for everybody here or just one of the particular candidates. We do have a microphone. We have people watching at home, so I want you to be able to uh, speak into the microphone. Raise your hand, and the uh, Justin Short back there will... Um, come and uh, provide the microphone to you, but um, we'll go ahead and start with this gentleman right up here. I'm going to make you run all the way to the front, Justin Short. Right here. Great. Um, can go I ahead and stand two, up, too. Can I ask uh, one question to two people? Sure. Okay. Um, Bernard, you uh, on Facebook, you talk about being the most progressive candidate, and tonight you talked about being most independent and aligning yourself with the most, well, arguably most conservative person in the legislature. Uh, he's known as Neverett because he votes no a lot. Um, <laughs> where exactly do you align? And then for Mr. Brian Watson, uh, you uh, talked about double digit uh, returns. You know that means double digit risk. Are you willing to risk uh, Colorado's investments? Great, start with Bernard. Great questions, thank you. So so to, uh, to answer your first question about aligning with Justin, um, good ideas can come from, from anywhere. Good ideas can come from Republicans, <laughs> right? <laughs> right? Yeah, thanks, so. Right? And I really believe I am a fiscal conservative. I want to save, I want to save money. I want to save everybody money. But I know that then the research I did, then, and the one thing I'll fault, fault Walker with, he didn't do the research. I looked at other states and how, and those pension programs that are performing well, and those states that have pr pension programs that perform well have a minority of plan members on their board, and they have, a, they have much more finance and economics expertise. It, and it, it, it just, and it's, it's kind of just like a shocker, huh? You know, more finance and economics expertise. So uh, I am a progressive. I, I do believe, I'll say it, I believe in universal health care. I believe health care is a human right. I do. Uh, I think it's, it's a very complex issue. Uh, I know that, you know, uh, that it, it, it's, it's incredibly complex. The financing of it's complex. But I think, and we're not going to get anywhere as a state with, with one governor or, or one uh, party uh, trying to find a fix for things. It's going to be a team effort. And we're going to have to have a treasurer that's going to look to ideas on both sides to solve, to solve problems. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So second question for me? Yes. So um, I appreciate you being here, um, but I respectfully disagree with your statement uh, that double-digit returns mean double-digit risk. Uh, no class that I ever take in college say uh, make that correlation. And in my 18 years of doing investments uh, with billions of dollars of transactions, uh, that has not been the case. Um, there are good returns out there, but again, the first and foremost for the state's assets is to be a good steward and be conservative of the funds. That is the, one of the primary roles. You're not going to Vegas with this money. At the same time, in proper asset allocation, and I'd be happy to sit down after and, and speak about this with you, you want to take a certain percentage of your portfolio and look for some double-digit returns within conservative means and bounds, good IRR, ROI, et cetera, and you can achieve it. Whereas the mass of your portfolio is in very safe investments. And some are liquid, some are not so liquid. It's about proper asset allocation. So again, I respectfully disagree with your thesis, and I'd be happy to have that conversation over a cup of coffee with you. Great. Next questions. Anyone from this side? Justin, to this young man in the black and yellow shirt. First, I'd like to apologize up front if this gets a little bit rough. Um, the concept of bonds being a conservative investment at a 1% return is laughable, I think, at this point. 
the even saying that it's a, a trillion dollar deficit, you're at least seven digits short. So in that way, if you potentially have to take a haircut against the against those bonds, how how could you describe that as conservative? That would be to everyone on the board. Does anybody want to start? Brian, you were looking to raise your hands over there. Yeah, I would be happy to. Uh, I think if you are looking for a, a low return in the bond market right now, uh, buyer beware. Again, we're at a frothy point in the economy right now, and what goes up definitely comes down. That's you know economics 101. And when you look at the things of inflation, inflation is right around the corner for us. And if you're looking for a 1% return or whatever the bond is of the particular day, you're actually, actually going to be losing money uh, as time goes on. We're in a constant treadmill with the economy in that you either need to stay up with on that treadmill or things like inflation will continue to deep, uh, deepen the hole for you as a state and a people. Great. Kevin? Uh, something to be aware of is uh, the state treasurer is not a hedge fund manager. Uh, the job of the treasurer is not first and foremost to, to, to uh, get to maximum return on the investment as much as it is to literally protect the principal. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, taking your talent and going and burying it, but, but there are statutory limitations, pretty strict ones, on how these dollars are to be used and to be spent. Now, if you want to roll that over to PARA, which is, of course, not the treasurer's direct responsibility, there they do have a much wider spectrum of investment opportunities. Would you call a $34 trillion deficit defensive and protective? Uh, and, and let me just be very careful and be very mindful of the time here as yep. well. I'm, I'd simply say that, that, that uh, uh, PARA has gotten into this, uh, this $34 or $83 billion hole by, um, by management that looks towards the short term in simply maximizing benefits for the beneficiaries without an eye towards the long term. Uh, it, it, I can call it nothing less than irresponsible management or simply management without any true knowledge. And that's why I would certainly say that when it comes to para, we need a better mix of our board, which of course sounds like everybody agrees with. So I'll leave it at that okay. and put it um, Before, I would, Justin Everett asked to go next, so I'm just going to. Well, I mean, that's part of the problem. I mean, you need to diversify the portfolio, but you need to critically evaluate all the options out there. Also work with the legislature. I actually passed legislation long before uh, I planned on running for treasurer, which actually was last spring, on allowing the state treasurer sort of more diversity into what they can invest in. So I think you need to critically evaluate every instrument out there to see what kind of high return we can get, especially if we're looking at it as as Jeff said, at 58% funded at this point. In fact, one of the Denver Post articles called Para Ponzi, one of the board members, who's a Hickenlooper appointee, called Para Ponzi scheme, a Ponzi scheme, where it's money in, money out. So we're looking at a huge challenge coming up, and we need somebody with that finance background understands we need to diversify that portfolio, we need to get a better return, but we also need to minimize risk. But we have to really dig ourselves a hole, and that's why I brought up that it's going to have to be a cut to benefits at this point, because you know the cash flow that's going out of, of Pira, I mean, that's investments that we're losing out on now because they're not being invested in the market. Uh, can okay. I respond to that really quickly? Because I think it's going to touch on what Bernard's about to say as well. Uh, you mentioned all of the securities that are potentially available. Um, can anyone up here demonstrate a functioning understanding of the relationship between credit creation, cryptographic technologies such as Ethereum, and how that relates to Para? Well, let, let's give everyone a chance to answer the first question first, and we'll see if we have time. Go ahead, Bernard. The, that's, a, that's a difficult question. To clarify, one, one of the things that I want to say is Para has earned over the last 35 year, years uh, a rate of 9.8% which is pretty high. Uh, and actually, one of the reasons, if you, studying this problem, we didn't get to a $32 billion deficit with one decision, one bad decision or two bad decisions or three bad decisions. It happened over a long period of time. One of the things is Governor Bill Owens lowered the retirement age to 50. A bunch of people flooded into the retirement system. Uh, we had cost of living adjustments that were well beyond the rate of inflation. A bunch of things happened. But what we need to be very sober about and very conservative about is the future and going forward. And what, like one of my favorite quotes is uh, Yogi Berra said, uh, predictions are very hard, especially about the future, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, so that's why and, uh, you know, somebody with an economics forecasting background is needed. Uh, again, the, the, the state treasury is different. These are separate things I want to just clarify. The state treasury earns about 1.1% 1 
Uh, and one of the things, again, I mentioned really quickly, well, briefly, was public banking. With the public bank, and we, that, Wells Fargo pays us 1.1% on our $7 billion, and they're, they're taking, taking that money and putting it to work somewhere else. And with the public bank, and again, I, I encourage everybody to look at this, uh, we would do much better. As far as your question goes, um, you know, I have a graduate degree from MIT, and I, I, I'm sorry, I can't answer your, your, your question on the connection between credit creation, cryptographic technology, and what was the third part? Para. Para? Yeah, how would you use cryptographic technology as credit creation to fix para? I mean, well, cryptographic we technology has become hundreds yeah. of billions we, of dollars. Of I want to make sure so we get a chance to tell it. I, don't think, it. That's my I, I can't I answer that right now. I'll have to, I'll have to get back to you. All right. <laughs> Let's, uh, Polly Lawrence, and then we're going to go uh, Charles, and then I've got some closing questions here real quick, okay. and then we're going to vote. Um, you know, just to echo what, what you've heard up here, there's a very different um, investment strategy for the treasurer's office and para. Right. The treasurer's office, you're charged with making sure that money is safe and secure, and it's liquid so you can meet the, ste the state's bill, so you can pay your bills on time. So. A rate of return is not the priority for the treasurer's office. It's making sure that your tax dollars are safe. Uh, for PARA, one of the problems that they've had is they've overpromised. They promised an 8% return year over year when that was an unrealistic return. Uh, they also allowed people to buy weeks um, in 2000 for ridiculously low amounts of money. And people took out loans and they bought years and years of service so that they could then retire in their mid 40s and collect a retirement for two, you know, three times longer than they worked in the system. I mean, those are problems that, that we had. And, you know, we're not allowing people to buy weeks for those reduced rates anymore. But those are some of the problems that we had. And, and the pair of retirement. Um, investment strategy is very different. They are looking for rates of return and they have a broader mix of assets where some of it is a little bit riskier than not a lot of it because they don't want to take a chance on another losing another 26% like they did uh, with the last downturn. Uh, but they are getting a better rate of return. I think this year it's going to be in double digits, but that's still not going to make up for the hole that we have right now. So there is a dramatic difference between Treasures, cash management, and Paris management. Great. Charles, last one. Well, it's going to be hard to add much to that, but uh, yeah, there is a very distinct, a very distinctive difference. The, the, the state treasurer is only investing money that's already been spoken for. It's the tax dollars that all of y'all have paid in to throughout the year, and we have to have that ready when it's time to pay your bills throughout that year. And so, of course, we're very conservative and also statutorily re, uh, bound to be that way. Whereas PARA, I mean, there, there, there's more than, you know, in, in, in PARA's case, the money coming in, for, forget about the earning. I mean, the money coming in wasn't sufficient, you know, based upon the assumptions that, of what they thought they'd earn. But I mean, you know, if you're not getting the contributions from you know, either side, whether it's from the employer or the employee, I mean, it doesn't matter, you know, you're not going to be, even Brian's not going to be able to make enough money to, to cover if you're only contributing 50% of what you should. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that's, that's the fallacy there. Great. We Thanks. got everyone to answer those questions. Everyone did. We didn't miss anyone. Okay. I'm going to ask a series of questions. I just want you to raise your hand if you agree. I'm going to do one minute closing statements and then we're going to vote. So we're coming down to the very end here. Do you agree that we need to raise the retirement age uh, for para? Said everybody raise them high. We can't see. All right. We need to raise the retirement age. Do we need to reform the para board? Everybody agrees with that. Do we need uh, more transparency in the para process? Everybody agrees with that. Uh, do we need to provide a benefits cost, cost by uh, freezing wages or freezing uh, cost of living? Yep, there is a time you have to do it. Maybe. Four, four there? How long? I don't know. I mean, you, you could specify. <laughs> Just wondering if you feel that way. Um, do we need to address these double-digit returns that they're claiming to have? Do we need to lower their expectations on the returns? 
two. Okay, great. Uh, let's do one minute closings here. Mr. Watson, we'll start with you. Absolutely. So uh, one unique thing uh, that I would ask you to look at for my candidacy is not state taking a salary from the state treasurer's office. Treasurer Stapleton has said that he has expressed concern that there are certain politicians who may have a dog in the hunt, uh, being that you know they're looking to maybe line their own pockets or whatever it might be. I don't want. I want to be completely unbiased, and I want to serve you, because at the end of the day, these assets are yours. I want to take all of my business experience and philanthropy and everything and bring it to the state treasurer's office and to represent you every single day and to work extremely hard. I'd like you to learn more at brianwatson.vote, and I truly appreciate your time. Thank you. Great. Okay, Charles. Well, I want to thank everybody for st sticking it out and listening to all of us. And uh, at least I, I, I'm always encouraged by uh, informed voters, and so I very much appreciate you all being here. Just remember that uh, in addition to all the qualifications that I think everybody up here has, business degrees, finance degrees, uh, I think that uh, 11 years actually running the operations is very significant and experience does matter and go to Quinn to win. And I'm Charles Quinn Scheib. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the time that you've uh, given to this important issue, and I hope you'll look deeper into it. Uh, I've told you before, my website's kevinlundberg.com. Please check that out. But bear this in mind when looking at this position. What we're looking for is someone who b will be that full-time leader in the treasurer's office, not just leader of the treasurer's office, which is important, but leader for the state of Colorado life and liberty those are the values that i believe government needs to keep the eye on i've said that before i say it in closing comments that that my intention as state treasurer is to be that watchman on the wall to look after your wallet by looking after the financial integrity of the state but to go beyond that and to see how it does affect each and every one of us in our homes in our communities as we interact as a state, kevinlundberg.com. Thank you very much. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming out on such a cold evening. I think winter finally arrived in Colorado. Um, I think you have some great choices up here. And one of the differences that I bring is that I've helped run a company that's been in business since 1924. I've signed the front of a paycheck. I've taken on labor unions and I won those battles. So I'm not afraid to take on big battles and, and make sure that I'm watching out for the tax dollars for everyone in Colorado. Um, I've worked successfully with both chambers and both sides of the aisle, and that's exactly what an executive level office needs. Somebody who can reach out and come up with some great ideas that we can bring both sides of the aisle together with down at the Capitol. Um, I have a track record of doing that. And that's what I plan to do from this office. Again, my name is Polly Lawrence. My website is polly2018.com. Uh, we do have a sign up for email if you want to stay in touch with the campaign. And I hope I'll have a chance to talk to each of you a little bit more when we're done. Great. Thank you again for coming out tonight. So we need somebody with experience, which we do see a lot of experience up here. But also, who can you trust? Because we're going to have to do a lot of heavy lifting, make a lot of tough decisions. I'm the only one up here with the record of actually making those votes when the heat is on, under the spotlight, making those tough decisions that we're going to have to do to solve these problems with PIRA to actually make sure that our money is being invested. And also, somebody who has the record who's looked out for you, the taxpayer. It's we, the people. It's you, the taxpayer. This is hugely important, and these are core values that we need to have. So you want someone that actually has done this, and you can trust. And I'm the only one up on stage doing that. But I need your vote tonight in the straw poll. Also, we have a sign-up sheet, and my campaign coordinator, Christy Brown's right there. Please corner her. Uh, but thank you for coming out tonight. State Representative Justin Everett, I'd be honored to be your next state treasurer. Thank you, and God bless. Well, thanks, everybody, for coming out this evening. Again, my name is Bernard Douthit. Um, and maybe, the, maybe a key point to stress is independence, because that's what I hear that people, uh, people want. They want somebody who is not taking corporate money, who's not taking special interest money. And, and again, uh, one of the reasons why you know, we, we maybe are stuck in where we're, where we're at is because we have a lot of that happening. 
Um, so I am not taking corporate money. I'm not taking special interest money. And I think we, we can do better than the status quo. Again, my name is Bernard Douthit. I hope you'll vote for me tonight. Uh, you can find more information out about me at BernieForTreasurer.com. Thanks. Great. Let's give all of our candidates a round of applause. Uh, it, it's not easy to run for office. You're often out late nights like tonight. You're away from your family. You're, you're putting your business on hold to, to seek uh, public service. And uh, I really appreciate the fact that they're seeking to earn our votes here, and that means a lot to us. We're going to collect the uh, straw polls now, so you, you have last few seconds to vote here. We'll be passing the hat like, uh, like a church. So... Put it in. Please only vote once. Remember, you're, you're at Colorado Christian University. Uh, no multiple voting here. So the winner of tonight's straw poll at the Centennial Institute, Colorado State Treasurer Forum, is Justin Everett. With 35% of the vote. So well done, Ms. Representative Everett. Coming in second place, Mr. Watson, with 22.6% of the vote. Third place, Representative Lawrence with 19.8% of the vote. Fourth place, Kevin Lumberg with 10.4% of the vote. Fifth place, Bernard Douthit with 7.5% of the vote. And sixth place was a tie between Charles and Britta Horn, who was unable to make it tonight, but uh, <laughs> congratulations, guys, for sixth place. Um, but again, thank you all so much for coming out and be a part of this. We look forward to seeing you February 23rd here. Thanks so much.